God bless everyone. Hello, everyone. God bless you. I give honor to my Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ, and declare that his name is the only name whereby men shall be saved. I am Donald L. Kirkwood, the senior pastor of Gospel Truth Tabernacle of God Church in the wonderful city of Detroit, Michigan. God bless you. Today is Tuesday, November the 20th. Wow, time is flying. The 20th of November, just a few days before the Thanksgiving holiday. And I pray that all of you are giving God thanks whether you have a little or a lot. Give God thanks for what you have. And those that don't have anything, if you don't have, let me say this on the air right now. If you don't have anything, text me. Yeah, you can go to Donald underscore Kirkwood at att.net. If you don't have anything, text me. I'm going to make sure you have something for this holiday. Now, understand what I said. I didn't say if you don't have anything you want. I said if you don't have anything. I don't think anybody ought to go through this holiday season with nothing. God has provisions out there. He got people with provisions. And who would I be, what would I be, and who would I be if you came to me and say, I'm starving, I say, I have nothing for you? No, I will make sure. I might fix you a plate, but I'll make sure you have something to eat. So, friends, keep that in mind. God bless you. I look forward to our conference tonight. I look forward to what God has shared or wants to share with each of us. And may you be encouraged even in this day, no matter what you're going through, be encouraged. Know that the God of the universe, the supreme ruler of the universe, is watching over you even now. And if you will only open your heart and receive him and trust him and just say, Lord, I'm here. Here am I. If you would just do that, he would be glad to come in and he fellowship with you, come in and sup with you. So thank you all for listening. We get ready to join our conference. At this time, we want to open up with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you this moment, this time, this season. We thankful, God. Even though this holiday season is about thanks, it's, it's Thanksgiving, it's about giving thanks, we give thanks to you all the time. Even when we wake up in the morning, we give thanks for you for the breath we take, for opening up our eyes. God, we, we, we go to our refrigerator and open the doors and we have food. Even if we don't have food, the light comes on when we open the door. And even if the light don't come on, God, we have a door handle we can grab. You have given us provision. We have provided things in our life and we just trust you. We thank God bless each and every listener online right now. God, meet us in the area of our need. You know the problems we go through. We, you know the pain we suffer. You know the things that has been in our hearts. We, you know the family members that are struggling, God. We ask you to bless each of us, God. Bless our households. Take control of the household, God. Let your spirit flow. Let it flow. Let it flow in the name of Jesus, God. Bless our loved ones, God, whether it's husband, wife, children, God, relative. Bless them right now in the name of Jesus. And let there be a difference in their life because of who you are. God, we're thankful that this conference is available to us. And we ask you to bless us and we open up our hearts and our ears to you right now. In Jesus' name we pray and we all say, Amen, 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 amen. Well, another episode from the pastor's desk. As always, if you have a question or comment you would like to make, just press the number key, the number five, rather, and the star key on your telephone keypad, and it will light up my board to let me know that you have a comment or a question that you would like to present. So thank you all, and now our conference, we left off last Tuesday uh, at the 13th verse. We completed the 13th verse. Today we want to start at the 14th verse of the 14th chapter of Revelation. Revelation 14, 14, where we will begin today's lesson. And I'm going to try to complete this lesson, this uh, uh, chapter tonight. We go through verse 20. And let me say to you very shortly, we're going to be hyperspeeding through the rest of uh, the book of Revelation. There's only 22 chapters in Revelation. We're just about at six chapters away. I guess we're seven chapters away right now. And I just wanted to encourage you that uh, beginning, I think, with the 16th chapter, we will be taking like two and three chapters at a time. 
So probably by the end of December, we will be finishing Revelation. If someone has a subject that they would like for us to study, as you've been working with something, praying over something, or looking for the answer to something, present it to me. Let me know, and we'll see if we can move to that particular lesson next. I don't want to stop. I guess I got a roll going now. I don't want to stop with this Tuesday uh, uh, Christian ad. It's, it's very fruitful for me, and I pray that it's fruitful for you also. So if there's a subject you want to cover, or chapters or a book, a book you want to deal with, let us know. We'll start walking through that and see where God wants to take us. So let's get into our lesson today. Uh, 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 chapter 14, uh, verses 14 through 16 is a, is a, is a, it's the idea, or I should say, it covers a lot of ground. Uh, Jesus Christ, as you know, uh, this chap- 14th chapter of Revelation has highlighted the fact. It highlighted the fact that Jesus Christ is going to be victorious over all the ungodly and evils of this world. We have been studying Revelation for some time, and we have covered all the bad thing that's going to happen, and God wants to let us know, you know what, it's not going to all be gloom and doom, that Jesus is going to uh, triumph. He's going to triumph. So the 14th verse is taking a break away from a lot of the negative things that we saw happening, and he's trying to encourage us to let us know that in the end, Jesus Christ is going to be victorious over all the ungodly and evils of this world. Now, that's the great announcement of the two angels, basically, that's in this chapter, the two angels we're going to cover uh, basically says that Jesus Christ is going to triumph uh, in the last days of human history. He's going to come back, and he's going to harvest the earth. I love the word that they use in the scripture. He's going to harvest the earth. He's going to reap those who believe in him and take take them on to heaven. He's going to, those people that believe in Christ, he's going to pick them up and take them on into heaven. But he's also going to judge the ungodly and the evils of this world. See, Christ, uh, the first 13 verses, we started dealing with the redeemed and how they're going to be blessed and how, you know, God's coming back and going to pick them up and take them away. And, and, and you know, even this section we get ready to cover now, 14 through 16, we're dealing with the, the godly people, the godly people, the harvest of the godly, the righteous. God is coming to take the righteous out of this world. Now, remember, we were dealing with tribulation time. So up until this point, we were reading about and studying about how all this fear and pain and all these things was coming up, and, and the righteous were running from the Antichrist and the false prophet. He, they were dodging, hiding in the wilderness, trying to escape the Holocaust that's coming upon the earth. Now in this 14th chapter, God wants to know that, you know, I know you've been going through some hard times, but understand, victory is coming. And you know what? That's a good word for us today. I know you've been going through some rough times, some rough periods in your life, and maybe for some of you, this is a rough season. I know it's, for me, it's, it's personally has an emotional edge to it because this is a time my mom and I used to really just, I guess, uh, fellowship together. We had our Thanksgiving dinner the night before Thanksgiving, and then we wake up in the morning and have Thanksgiving dinner all over again. We laugh and talk and sing songs and pray. We did all that. And not to have mother here any longer, it, 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 I can feel the emotional edge, the ebb and flow of the emotions. But you know what? I'm thankful for memories. I'm so thankful for memories. God has given us enough. And that's why I tell each of you, enjoy your folks while they're living. Enjoy your people. Our people, they've been saying that for a long time. They said it even to, to me when I was a kid. You better enjoy your parents while you have it. You know, and you, you, we really don't take that into effect until it happens, until the day comes when they're gone. And then you'd be looking back saying, wow. You know, there were things about mom. I used to always say, you know what, mom? You know, I just don't feel like, you know, doing that today. I wish I could have that opportunity again. It's like all the things you wanted to do, all the things you thought about doing, now that they're gone, you'd be like, wow, mom, just to hear 
your your voice. I think my dad used to sing a song about if I could hear my mother praying again, or, and then it was a whole bunch of things. It's, it's like I can see that. I can really feel that. I can hear that. And I want to say to you that still I'm blessed to have loved ones in this family, whether it's mother, father, even if it's a good friend, even if it's someone, a relative that you love. You know, hold on, cherish them. Let them know how special that they are. Let them know that they are a blessing in your life because I'm telling you, there's going to come a time when God's going to be calling these people home, and you're going to miss it. You will miss it. I don't care how hard you are, how tough you are. I don't care how emotionally stable that you think you are. There's going to be a time when you look back and say, wow, I sure wish I had so-and-so here again. You know, I sure wish I had, they could hear that voice. I sure wish I can be scolded once again, whatever the case may be. So keep that in mind. This is the holiday season where a lot of people are depressed. But we that are in Christ, we have no reason for depression. Christ has delivered us from the spirit of depression. He has delivered us from that. And I glorify in God all the time. That's the thing that helps me the most. Even when I get my weak moments and start thinking about mother, I think about the victory that she got over death. I think about how the, the devil tried to shackle her with fear. And God moved in and released the shackles off of her so that she could fly away with the Lord. The Lord sent the angel. He sent the angel for her. Stop that 27039 and opened up the door. And here she comes stepping out and got her to that chariot. God ushered her into the presence. I said, oh, my Lord, when I think about that, when I think about all the things that happened, my dad was running to the – my dad was running to – to death. He wanted death to come. Come get me at 70. He said, I'm ready because I saw what's on the other side. I couldn't understand that. I couldn't understand. How can somebody, well, when is it so good that you just want to run saying, say, Lord, take me now? But now that I have studied and matured to the point that I have matured in the Lord, that's why the devil want to keep you ignorant. That's why the devil want to keep you in fear. He want to keep the, the truth out of the situation because if you knew the truth, if you would know, only know the truth, you'd be running to the grave. All right. Now I'm not trying to be morbid, but I just want to let you know that there's victory beyond, beyond this life. There's so much more God got for you beyond this life. And we sometimes, we be, as one of the officials in the church that I grew up in said, if I was going to die, I'll grab every branch and tree I can hold on to. I ain't going nowhere. Well, no, that's not me. Because I see what's on the other side. I see it. And then when the Lord comes, no wonder he said, blessed are the dead who die in Christ. No wonder he said that. Lord Jesus, it was what a blessing he got. Well, okay. Let me see. Okay. Uh, I'll try to see where I left off of my notes. Okay, I talked about Jesus Christ is going to triumph. He's going to triumph in the last days of human history. Uh, uh, Jesus is coming back. I don't know if you knew that or not. He's coming back, and he's going to harvest the earth. He's going to harvest. That's what we're studying here, the 14th through the 16th verse of the 14th chapter. He's coming back to harvest the earth. He's coming back to reap those who believe in him and to take us on to heaven. Well, I said us, but I'll be gone in the first wave. These are those, these are those that were left in the tribulation, these the tribulation saints that have become saved. Christ has come, come back to give and take them back to heaven with him. But, but as I said earlier, he's also going to judge the ungodly and the evil of this earth. See, Christ and his followers will be vindicated. What do you mean vindicated? The world will see and know that Christ is truly the Son of God who came to earth to save man. Because right now the world, uh, I should say right now, but the world, one day the world is going to know that he was well worth forsaking the world and his pleasures and possession for. People don't believe that. Right now, you start telling people to live right, the first thing they say is, I don't want to give up this, and I don't want to give up my cigarettes, and I don't want to give up going to this, this club, and I don't want to give up this, and I don't want to give up this lifestyle, and I don't want to give up. You know, we always talk about what we don't want to give up. If the one day the world's going to get back and know 
and hopefully it won't be you, but they will look back and know that Jesus was well worth forsaking the world and his pleasures and possessions for. The world will one day know that he was well worth following and standing up for. They will also know that he was well worth even dying for. Oh, my God, that he was well worth denying oneself for, that he was well worth sacrificing everything and and well worth suffering persecution for. One day, the world is going to know that he was well worth it. When Jesus Christ returns in judgment, the world will know that he is exactly who he claimed to be. And who is that? The Son of God, the Lord and majesty of the universe. But it will be, what, too late. Oh, my God. I think every time I think about it being too late, I think about Noah. He preached and preached and preached and told people to forsake their ways and get ready to come into the ark. They laughed at him and joked and teased him and, and talked about that crazy man. And one day when the rain started to fall, he closed the door. And the people came beating on the door trying to enter, but it was too late. Don't let it be said too late for you. Jesus is returning in judgment. He is returning in judgment. He came the first time in mercy and grace to save people. But now, oh, according to this passage, now, the next time he comes, he returns in glory and majesty to judge the earth. This is the scene of this passage that we're about to study. This is the sixth great uh, assurance to believers. The day of harvest is coming. See, the Lord God is going to reap the earth. He's going to reap the earth, the believers are going to be taken home to heaven to live with God and Christ forever. And all the ungodly and evil are to be judged and shut out from God's presence. There's to be a perfect world in which nothing reign but godliness and righteousness. Can you imagine living in a world where the only thing that reigns is godliness and righteousness. No sin at all. (laughs) God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth, and believers, we the believers, are to have the glorious privilege of living there with God forever and ever. It is a privilege to live with God forever. It is a privilege. I didn't say a right. It's a privilege to live with God forever. Now, this is the scene of this passage, the great day of earth's harvest, the glorious harvest of God's dear people, the harvest of the earth will take place. Let's look at that 14th verse. And I look. And behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Here we see the harvester of the earth, the harvester. Who is the harvester? The Son of Man himself. The Son of Man is Jesus Christ. You know, I'm sure you know. Jesus Christ is not only what an ordinary man is, <laughs> a son of man. Jesus Christ is what every man ought to be, the son of man himself. You know, when you look at this, Jesus is everything a man ought to be. That is a mouthful right there because many men feel like, I ain't trying to be Jesus. I ain't, try, I ain't say you are trying to be Jesus. I said you, every man ought to be like Jesus. Now that says a mouthful because what is Jesus like that a man ought to be? That's a question for you to find out. 
I done given you all the answers. You need to read your book and find out what is it about this man that sets the pattern for my life. When he came to earth, he suffered through all the temptations and trials of life, just as all men do. But there is one vast difference with him. Jesus Christ never sinned. He was sinless. Therefore, he is the ideal man, the representative man, the perfect man, the embodiment of everything a man ought to be. Jesus Christ is the picture of the perfect Man before God. Everything that God wants a man to be is seen perfectly in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to be putting like this. As the son of man, he's the ideal servant of man. See, when Jesus Christ came to earth, and I know you all know he came to earth because he walked here, he uh, lived and cared for the poor the brokenhearted, the captive, the blind, the bruised, the outcast, the bereaved. That's not like some of you that I know. You know, they care for all of them. Jesus Christ is the perfect and ideal example of concern and caring. Do you know there's a lot of people in the world who don't care about anybody? You know, they don't show concern. They don't act like they're concerned. They don't act like they care. They're concerned about no one. But Jesus secured and set an example of how every person ought to serve others. But people don't believe this. People don't believe that God sent his son into the world to save people. People, many people, reject Jesus Christ as the sinless son of God. And that's the perfect son of man. That's the idea of what all sons of men should be. Some are willing to accept him as a great teacher and religious leader, but they rebel against, they deny, even curse him as the son of man. This is the reason Jesus Christ is going to return to earth as the son of man, to vindicate huh, exactly who he is. The world is going to know that the man, Jesus, the carpenter from Nazareth, is the very one who God sent to set the pattern for all men. God sent Jesus to set the pattern for all men, the pattern of how we should live and minister to others. <sighs> Do you have time for your neighbor? I ain't got no time for him. I got I got, I got to do something in the house. I ain't got no time to be talking about your pastor. I, I, I don't have no time to, to check on the old woman down the street. I ain't got time. She got family. Got to let her family check. I ain't got time to do it. Do you understand what, what Jesus expects from us? We only want to deal with the people we like. And half the time, we don't want to deal with them. But have you ever thought about you supposed to be dealing with the people you don't like? That you're supposed to bless those who despitefully use you? <laughs> oh, my God. The thoughts that we have about helping others. We help others only if it's going to help me in return. Uh, and that is something that hopefully, prayerfully, it would change. Hopefully, that would change. But Jesus came to be the example. He came to be the example how we are to serve others. Many people, as I said, many people don't believe it. But one day, he's going to vindicate exactly who he is. Okay. Uh, uh, I want you to understand how he returned, because this is talking about Jesus return, he shall return as the Son of Man. It's in this 14th verse, uh, we're dealing with the aspect that he's coming back because he told him, behold, a white cloud, he saw the cloud, saw somebody sitting on it. He, Jesus Christ shall return in a white cloud. See, white symbolizes the purity of heaven. It, it, uh, it says he will be coming from the world of purity and godliness, and he'll be coming in the purity and godliness of heaven to bring purity and godliness to the whole universe. Here the man comes from a world of purity and godliness. And in the purity and godliness of heaven, 
he brings purity and godliness to the whole universe. Isn't that interesting? Jesus Christ shall return wearing a gold crown on his head. Ah, a golden crown. Mm. Gold symbolizes value and preciousness. And the crown symbolizes royalty, rule, dominion, and sovereignty. Jesus Christ is coming to take his rightful place in the world, to conquer all the ungodliness and evil of the world, and to bring the rule and reign of God to the universe. See, nothing could be more precious nor of any more value than the rule of God upon earth. Life in God's new heaven and earth will be the most precious and valuable experience imaginable. Can you just picture that life in God's new heaven and earth? What would it be like to live in God's new heaven and earth? Because you know there's no sin there. There's going to be no devil there. There's going to be no evil there. There's going to be nothing but godliness uh, and righteousness. Jesus Christ shall return with a sharp sickle, according to the 14th verse. He's going to return with a sharp sickle in his hand. The sickle is a sharp tool with a a long knife-like edge used to harvest the grains of the field. Uh, This is a picture of judgment. You know, for some of you who's afraid of the devil, you seen the devil with this big sickle in his hand? That's judgment. That's a judgment. Here the angel has a sharp sickle in his hand where Jesus Christ returns with a sharp sickle. He's talking about Jesus here on that cloud. He returned with a sharp sickle in his hand. In other words, he's coming back to judge the world. That's why he's coming back. Coming back to bring judgment. Let's look at the 15th and 16th verse. And uh, and another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is right. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Oh, my God, there would be the harvest of the earth, the separation, in other words, of believers from the ungodly and the evils of the earth. Wouldn't that be an astonishing time when God is going to separate the believers from all others? You know, people, just imagine all the people who talk about they are believing now. Oh, yeah, I'm a believer. Oh, yeah, uh-huh. And they're raising their hand. You can't say, you can't, you better not say anything about them challenging their, their faith or belief. Lord, I am a believer. But here, the scene is going to be spectacular and awesome. There is Jesus Christ hovering over the earth with a sickle in his hand. And in a moment's time, every eye sees him. See, the sight is wonderful and glorious to the believer, for it means that the great day of their redemption has come. But it also means fear and horror to unbelievers, for it means that the great day of God's wrath has come to fall upon them. And with that, I want you to note two significant things. One, First, that the uh, the harvest of the earth will be ripe, ripe. And the second thing I want you to know is this, that the harvest will take place. It's going to be ripe, that the harvest of the earth will be ripe. And the second thing, that the harvest will take place. So let me go back to the first thing, that the harvest uh, of the earth will be ripe. Another angel comes out of the temple of God, that is, out of heaven, the temple of God, representing heaven itself. And, and that means that he comes from the very presence of God. That's what it means. And he's bringing the very message of God. What he has to say is from God himself. So the question is, what is the message? The harvest of the earth is ripe. The, the harvest of the earth is ripe. The time for God's son, 
the Son of Man to reap has come. Therefore, this angel is, uh, is going to shout, thrust in your sickle and reap. Mm. Now, note that the reference is to Christ himself. It's time for him, Jesus, to reap his harvest. Who is his harvest? Those who belong to him. It's time for him to separate his own followers from the ungodly and the evil and to take his followers to be with him. Keep in mind that this is speaking of the end time, the end time, right before the world is to end. The believers, the followers of Christ upon earth during those days will have suffered enough at the hands of the Antichrist and the godless world. They have been through so much. The heart of Christ, as much as he longed for all people to be saved, as much as he may wish to continue to be patient so that one more person might be saved, he cannot take it anymore. The time will come when he cannot bear the ungodliness and evil against the people and against himself any longer. It is time, time for the great day of his harvest, time to reap the fruit. He, uh, he, uh, uh, his dear servants, where it's time for a dear service to be taken home to heaven. A dear service we have borne so much trial and so many temptations. And then I'll go to the second thing I would know is that the harvest does take place. Jesus Christ thrust in the sickle. Remember the angel said, thrust in your sick sickle that the earth will be reaped. Well, Jesus does it. He thrusts in his sickle and the earth is reaped. The believers are harvested. They are taken out of the world and away from his ungodliness and from the evil. They are harvested to be with Christ forever and ever and ever. They are delivered and free from all the toils and all the sufferings of this world. Never again will a believer suffer due to mistreatment of an ungodly person. Never again will a believer suffer due to hunger or cold or heat. Never again will a believer suffer due to disease or accident. Never again will a believer suffer due to toil and uh, exhaust, exhaustion. Never again will a believer suffer due to temptation and trial. And never again will a believer suffer to the sin and ungodliness and evil and death. Never again. Never again will the believer suffer a single tear. The believers of the end time, those dear believers who trust and stand for Christ against the Antichrist and his godless society all believers are going to be harvested and taken home to heaven to be with Christ forever and ever. What a wonderful thought. Christ is going to join us together, us and all of our dear loved ones who have gone before and all of the tribulation saints. Jesus Christ is going to take us all and from one great mass of society with which he is going to populate the new heaven and the new earth. He's going to take all of us that have given our life to him, and he's going to take us and unite us with the rest of the other tem- uh, 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 tribulation saints and all the saints who had died before us, he going to put us all together. What does that song say when, we, when all God's children get together? Well, that's what we, we talking about. I ain't talking about sitting down on the banks of the Jordan. I'm talking about getting in the presence of God. He's going to take us to a new heaven and a new earth, earth. And all the believers of all times are to be the citizens of the new heaven and earth. Who do you know that was one of the believers of all times. I can personally say my loved ones. I was, you know, I, I don't know too much past my grandma. I didn't know my 
my my people, my my grandmother, my great grandmother. I didn't know her. I heard talk of her, but I think about Kay Williams. I look at Kay Williams. And I think about her often. How she was not only just a grandma, but she was an example of doing what God said do. And I said, wouldn't it be awesome to join hands with my grandma again? Wouldn't it be awesome to join hands with my uncles and my aunt, my cousins? I can see my cousins now. And wouldn't it be awesome to join hands with mom and dad? See, I, and you can put whoever you want in that picture, but... All the believers of all time are going to be the citizens of the new heaven and new earth. I wonder if I'll be driving my Lincoln to go over somebody's house. Probably not, because y'all say I'll be having my wings. <laughs> well, whatever I'm telling you right now, it's going to be an awesome time. It's going to be an awesome time. We are to be the servants of God and Christ, the servants who oversee the operation of the universe for God. That's what I tell people all the time. We're going to be servants for Christ. Do you know God, Christ saved us and we're supposed to be kings and princes? We, our, whole, our whole purpose is to oversee the operations of the universe for God. Think about that. I oftentimes say, and I think I made this last point before I get there, uh, uh, I want you to know some this this picture that I'm trying to paint before your eyes is the picture of the believer of the end time being harvested. That's the picture I'm trying to paint. The believer at the end time, after all the suffering they've been through, running from the Antichrist and trying to hang out for the false prophet and all the stuff because they were being tortured and killed and set upon by these individuals. God's going to come a time where he said enough is enough, and he's going to harvest. He's going to collect all those people who are the believers of the end time, and he's going to harvest it, harvest them. This is the picture of their being taken up from off the earth and taken into the shelter of heaven, taken out of the storm and the violent weather of a godless world. This is the picture, if you can get your mind there, of the wheat being separated from the tares. Uh, the picture of the Son of Man reaping his harvest, his fruit, his people. But this is exactly what Christ in Scripture says. Oh, my God, this is powerful. I want, let's see, do I got time? Yeah, I got time. Let's go to 14th. Uh, 17 through 20. See, uh, verses 17 to 20 is the uh, covers the day of coming when the world, this is the opposite of what we've been dealing with. Now we're dealing with the, uh, the time when the world will be ripe for judgment, a day when ungodliness and evil will be cut totally loose and run rampant upon earth. Oh, it is the horror of lawlessness and evil and murder, which will run so wildly that Christ cannot take it anymore. The people of the world will be engulfed with idolatry, murder, sorcery, immorality, and stealing. They will be materialistic and worldly. It almost seems like it's like that now, don't it? But it's going to be worse. Atheistic and God-rejecting. There will be no hope. No hope whatsoever that they will ever change and turn to God. There is coming a time when the situation upon earth is utterly hopeless and helpless. When that day comes, then comes the great tribulation of the earth. And in the end of the great tribulation, in the very last days of world history, Jesus Christ shall reap the earth that's what we just got to talk about. He's going to take the godly out of there first. The last passage looked at the reaping of the godly. This passage, verses 17 through 20, uh, looks at the reaping of the ungodly and the evil of the world. In other words, this is the great day of earth's harvest, the terrible harvest of the ungodly. 
in the evil of this world that would take place. Look at verse 17. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and also having a sharp sickle. Here comes the harvester, a great angel. He comes out of the temple of God. He, this means that he's from heaven, that uh, he's, from, he's from God, that his very presence, he comes from the very presence of God, and on a special mission for God. And what do he have? He holds a sharp sickle in his hand, the threshing tool of the farmer or vineyard keeper. 18 through 19, another verses 18 through 19, and another angel came out from the altar, uh uh-oh, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth. For her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. Here we see the terror of the harvest of the ungodly. There will be a terror. Oh, my God. How can I say it? There will be uh, the terror of the angelic cry. This is the second angel, but he does not come from God's presence. Look where he said he came from. He came from the altar of incense. Some of you remember Sunday. I tried to cover the altar. I said something about the altar of incense. The altar of incense, that is the altar where the prayers of God's people are kept. And I was talking about the temple at the time. I was covering, take us back to the temple teaching that I gave. The altar of incense, which is beyond the veil, which is before the veil, the altar of incense, uh, uh, was the reason I say it before the veil, because the priest had to go and take the prayers of the saints behind the veil to the holy, the holy. So here we're trying to get you to understand, to see that here this angel came from the altar of incense, the place where the prayer of God's people are kept. And also where the martyrs, remember we were talking about the martyred saints of Christ, they were all stationed in heaven. They were stationed in the in the veil, in the, I'm sorry, in the altar of incense. They were all be, before the altar of incense. Remember, there have been millions of believers martyred, killed throughout the century. And there will be millions more martyred in the end time throughout all of their suffering. They were praying for the same thing for which we pray, for God's kingdom to come to earth, for righteousness and justice and love to rule upon the earth. All those prayers was before the altar of incense. Now this angel comes from beyond or out of the altar of incense. This angel appears, and he symbolizes that these prayers of God's people are about to be answered. Can you follow me? So here he comes from among the prayer. And when the people saw him, they said, oh, he must be getting ready. God must be getting ready to answer the prayers that we've been hollering because here comes the angel. The Lord Jesus is now ready to rid the world of all the ungodly and evil. I want you to notice two things about this. Number one, the angel has the power of fire. This means that the fire of God's judgment now is to be cast upon the earth and all believers are to be consumed. All, all, all unbelievers, I'm sorry. All unbelievers are to be consumed. The angel has the power of fire. The fire of God's judgment is going to be cast upon the earth and all the unbelievers are going to be consumed. And the second thing I want you to know is that the angel cries out for judgment to begin. <laughs> How, I want you to notice how the ungodly and the evil of the earth are said to be clusters of grape hanging on the vine of the earth. I know somebody who loves grapes. And here they said the ungodly, is the evil peoples of the earth, are said to look like clusters of grapes hanging on the vine. There are two vines in the earth the vine of Jesus Christ, and the vine of the world. (laughs) 
See, Jesus Christ in John 15, 5, Jesus Christ in John 15, 5 said that he is the vine and his followers are the branches. That was John 15 and 5. Well, here, this passage also said that the earth has a vine, a vine of worldliness and ungodliness and evil, a vine that will reach its full growth in the end time and the Antichrist and his followers. See, I want you to know a person chooses upon which vine he will hang. Oh, my God, what a revelation. A person has the choice to decide which vine he will hang on. He chooses which cluster of grapes he wishes to be a part of. The followers of Jesus Christ or the followers of the world and of the Antichrist. The followers of righteousness or the followers of the ungodly and evil. My question to you is which one do you which one are you a part of? So you can't say both. And you can't say, well, pass on somewhere in the middle. There ain't no middle. The Lord Jesus said, either you for me or against me. He said that. So where is it? What side you on? I ain't. I, and for those of you who said, I don't know, or I haven't picked a side, let me say this to you. The devil already had picked a side for you. The fact that you were born, you were born in sin. You were born in sin. When you were born, you were automatically associated with the unbeliever side. That's why you had to be born again. That's why I've been hollering and preaching to you about giving your life to God. That's why I've been telling you it's time is to get ready is right now. Because when you were birthed into this world, you were birthed in sin. And that sin has followed you all the way to the point where you have to be born again. God had to send his spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, to come and rule in your heart. He had to take away the stony heart of sin and replace it with a fleshly heart of righteousness, pliability. It's pliable. It, it moves. It's able to bend. It, it don't burst when your pressure gets under it. That heart is what you need where God can be able to feed you and guide you. There will be the time of God's wrath. It is coming. It's a frightening picture of terror and horror of the terrible judgment that come. When God began to set this whole picture up, he set this whole picture up to let people know here, there's a day coming when God's wrath is going to fall on the earth. The angel lifts the sickle high in the air, and with the swift stroke of God's omnipotent power, he thrushes the sickle of eternal judgment and to the earth. The vine of the earth is cut. And guess what? All the ungodly and evil of the earth are cut down and gathered together. They are then cast into the wine press of God's wrath. What is the wine press of God's wrath, Pastor? The wine press was a, th- a throth. A throth usually made out of either stone or brick that was placed over a large vat or pot. The grapes off the vine were placed into the throth, and people would trample the grapes, and the juice would flow through the holes in the bottom of the throth into the vat underneath. I hope you can picture that, okay? This is a graphic picture of the wrath of God. God's wrath will be like the trampling of the grapes underfoot. The picture is that of no mercy, no compromise, and no grace. The picture is twofold. It is the trampling of the grapes was deliberate and purposeful. Ah, And the second thought, the trampling of the grapes was thorough. Let me go back to the first thought. The trampling of the grace was deliberate and purposeful. The purpose, the reason for the tramping of the grapes and the wine press was to get the juice out of the grapes and not to save the grapes. There was no love, no compassion, no feeling for the grapes. The grapes were to be trampled underfoot. This would be the wrath 
of God. God's wrath will be deliberate and purposeful. It will be to execute perfect judgment upon the ungodly and the evil of the world. There will be no love, no compassion, no mercy, no feelings extended out in the terrible days of the harvest of the earth. All persons, every single one of us, will stand before God who is perfectly just, who in his perfection and justice must execute justice upon all persons. All the ungodly and evil of this world will be cast into the wine press of God's wrath and trampled underfoot without any compassion and without any mercy. And then the second thought was the trampling of the grapes were thorough. The cups of grapes were trampled and trampled until every single grape was crushed. So shall the wrath of God be. God's wrath will be thorough. Not a single person shall escape the wrath of God. Mm, my God, help me. All the ungodly and evil of this world shall be placed in the wine press of God's holy wrath. God help us. God's wrath will execute perfect justice. God will be totally, totally unlike men. He will show no partiality. He will show no favoritism and no discrimination. You need to know that. He ain't going to show no partiality. There's no favoritism and there's no discrimination. God will see that all persons receive exactly what they deserve, exactly what their works were uh, upon the earth. God will see that every unjust and ungodly and evil act against God and others is repaid, measured out exactly on the basis of what each person did. Oh, just think about that, saints. God's wrath will be perfect retribution. No ungodly person will be judged for anything that he did not do. But he will be judged for what he did do. The ungodly and evil are guilty. They never trusted Jesus Christ to bear the guilt of their ungodliness and evil for them. Therefore, they must bear the guilt Oh, Jesus. They must bear the guilt themselves. They must suffer the wrath of God. And the wrath of God is going to trample underfoot all the ungodly evils of this world. I think I got time to try to finish this. Let's go to the 20th verse. 20th verse says, And the wine press was throttled without the city. And blood came out of the wine press, even into the horse's bridle, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. We all have heard of the terror of Armageddon. When I was a child, my dad used to talk Armageddon, talk about Armageddon, the battle of Armageddon. He talked about how the blood is going to flow so deep that it would be up to the horse's bridle. And I used to get so scared, like, oh, God, who, who could survive that? He's talking, about, he's talking about Armageddon, the place where the wrath of God is going to fall. But there's two points I want you to see about this war, this battle at Armageddon, at, of Armageddon. One, the wine press of God's judgment is trampled down outside the city. The city, see, always referred to Jerusalem. There's a reference to what the Bible and believer call the, the battle of Armageddon, the day of the Lord, the final battle of human history. What's the number they call it? Uh, uh, the Satan's rule upon earth, uh, the judgment of God upon the ungodly and evils of this world. This is a picture of the armed forces of the world. Picture this. The armed forces of the world gathering outside Jerusalem under the leadership of the Antichrist. They are there in all their earthly glory and might, or so they think. <laughs> While there, the midnight hour of judgment strikes. The time for God's eternal judgment 
and wrath to fall comes. And the quickest defeat in human history occurs against the greatest army ever amassed by man. The Antichrist and the armies of his military might are destroyed by the very word of the Lord's mouth and by the glory of his appearance. Second Thessalonians two and eight. Second Thessalonians two and eight describes this graphically. Uh, uh, and, and, and if you you want, you can go and read that. But also, I want you to know that the horrifying scene will look what, what the horrifying scene will look like. Picture what this scene is going to look like. Blood will flow out of the wine press of God's wrath. And the blood will be as deep as two feet in some places. I want you to picture this. Blood's going to flow out of the wine press. God's wrath is going to fall on the ungodly. And the ungodly is going to be consumed so quickly, so thoroughly that their blood is going to be two feet in depth in some places. That's an odd blood. Now, I want you to picture this because blood doesn't sit in a depth unless it's down in a valley. In other words, it got to be something for the blood. It ain't just running, spreading down the street. It accumulates in low depressed areas. So here, there's going to be so much blood flowing from God's wrath. And this blood that's flowing is not our blood. It's the ungodly. Understand that this is the blood of the ungodly. They're going to suffer. If some of you don't accept Jesus Christ, this is talking about you. Your blood is going to be spilled under God's feet. And it's going to be so deep that it's going to be two feet deep in some places. And the distance that the blood would flow is said to be about 184 miles. 100. And 84 miles, that's 1,600 furlongs, 184 miles. You talking about, about the length of Palestine. See, this picture begins to be painted is that of a thorough judgment. The army of the ungodly and all their glory and might will be immediately and thoroughly destroyed by the wine press of God's wrath. Oh, my God. Friends, I have reached the end of this chapter. I don't know how to say it any more plainer than for those who refuse to accept Christ, the danger that you run and the risk you are taking by not accepting him now. If you wish to accept Jesus Christ right now, just pray this simple prayer. God, I humble myself before you. I am a sinner, and I need your blood of your son to cover me and escort me into your presence. Father, I believe Jesus died for my sin, and I believe he rose, oh, my God, that I might have salvation. Come now and receive me as I receive you as my personal Savior. If you pray that prayer and pray that in earnest, I ain't talking about just repeating the words after me. You have to pray this in earnest. If you pray that prayer in earnest, then you are born again and God will elevate you. Understand one thing, friends. I've always said you need to get in a Bible teaching church. I've always said that. It's not enough to sit here on this line and accept Christ or say I accept Christ and then go on about your business and never join a church, never get involved with a church where you can be taught. The reason is you need to be taught. And some of you who've been in church for a long time need to be retaught because you wasn't taught right. It's time now to get your life together. There's no time for foolishness. And I said this last week for those of you who heard the broadcast last week and those who didn't can hear the, can hear the tape. 
I said it's time to make a serious commitment in your life. It's time to change. Too many of us is walking the fence, trying to be nice and trying to be naughty. Too many of us. And God said, enough is enough. It is time for you to get right with God. Jesus Christ, God only accepts righteousness and holiness. Understand what I'm saying? We can't be holy before God outside of Jesus. We have to come to Jesus and his holiness and his righteousness represents us before his Father. It's not ours. We can't be holy enough. We can't be clean up enough to say, I'll get clean up and then come to church. You can't get clean enough. It's time for you to make a commitment to God and say, Father, I'm here. Now teach me your way. Friends, thank you so much for listening tonight. Again, thank you for another episode from the pastor's desk. I pray that you receive the word tonight. I pray that God has picked your heart and has spoke to you in such a way that you know I need to repent of the things that I've done. And if that is you, just simply repent. First John 1, 9 tells us that if thou will confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. God said, all you got to do is come to me and tell me what you're doing. I know what you're doing. I see it. But just come and let me know that, hey, you sorry for it. Hey, you don't want to do it no more. Hey, you give it up. And God said, I'll take care of it. I'll forgive your sins. I'll clean it up, and I'll forgive you for all unrighteousness. This is our goal, is to be unrighteous before God. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean that. To be righteous before God. That definitely ain't our goal. Our goal is to be righteous before God. It ain't nothing for us to be unrighteous. We don't have to do nothing to be unrighteous. But to be righteous, we got to accept his son, Jesus. So let's do that today. And keep praying for those who had not yet received God's word. Have a wonderful holiday, everyone, a wonderful Thanksgiving season. Remember those that are less fortunate than you. Remember to reach out and let somebody know that you love them. And unto them, unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And we all say amen. Until next week with another episode from the pastor's desk, I say to each and every one of you, love ye one another. God bless you all.